some people who have been in the solar industry will probably remember what's now considered a, a mixed or a failed track record of prior generation of solar thermal projects in the U.S. Imagine if we encountered an execution challenge with solar PV and just stopped deploying it in the U.S. Now is the time. Let's revive it. Let's bring it back to the U.S. We are the only domestic provider of commercial scale concentrating solar technology, which is also really exciting. Hey, welcome back, Solar Warriors. If you're new to the show, I just want to say thank you for giving us a chance to earn your attention and by offering up the one thing that you won't get back, and that is your time. I promise you are investing it well today. We are going to dig into an area, a corner of renewable energy that I haven't had a chance to explore a lot in Suncast. In fact, I can't think of having, of when I've had another executive from, uh, from a concentrator solar company, but we have had an entire series on green hydrogen. And I have a sense that we're going to get into that discussion today. So buckle up, you're in for a pretty fun ride. We're going to talk about the experience of joining a company and taking it public and being a CEO and uh, rising from other roles into the CEO role. Christy Obiaya is the CEO of Heliogen. She brings deep operational and financial expertise, having been the CFO prior to the CEO role. And she couples that experience with growing and managing energy and infrastructure development, sustainable technologies. Prior to Heliogen, Christy was head of strategy at Bechtel, big, big company that many of you would recognize. And, oh, she got her engineering and business degrees from a little com little place called MIT. So we're going to learn from someone that I've really come to respect and I, I think has some insight into where our energy transition is going and what it is going to take to get there. I hope that you are subscribed to the show. That's the only way that you're going to know for sure that you don't miss out on our twice weekly content just like this. Each and every week, we dig in to the stories of clean energy founders and C-suite executives on the front lines of the energy transition. And of course, we've got more than 630 episodes in our back catalog that you can find at mysuncast.com. But for now, let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solar Warrior, as we tune into another powerful conversation here on Suncast. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to the fine folks at Heliogen for helping coordinate this interview. Christy, I know that you're super busy, not only uh, as an executive, but the executive of a publicly traded company. I am always honored to get one-to-one -one time with, uh, with someone who's running such uh, an, uh, an important endeavor. Uh, welcome to Suncast. Thank you, Nico. Great to be with you. I want to, as I usually do, start out with a quote. This one is actually one of my favorites, I have it printed out on the wall in my office and regular listeners will know that I also have them cycling through on my desktop on my computer. And this one is from H. Jackson Brown and it says, don't waste time learning the tricks of the trade. Instead, learn the trade. Mm. <laughs> well, first reaction to that quote, and I'm curious if you have any quotes that, uh, that you kind of memorialize or share with others to inspire them. I love that because I, I mean, I'll, I'll reflect on your quote because I think um, it points to the fact that at the end of the day, you have to be deep somewhere and there's no replacement for, you know, the getting the, getting the boost on the ground experience. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great example. At a 30,000 foot level, if you're at a, a dinner party or, you know, at, RE plus having networking conversations with folks that maybe don't know much about your background or what you're trying to accomplish. How do you describe the problem that you all have created Heliogen to solve? Yes. Climate change is the greatest challenge ahead of us as humans. I could honestly think of um, no greater area to be putting our effort and blood, sweat, and tears into at this point. Um, you know, notwithstanding all of the great work that goes on in poverty alleviation and what have you. But the biggest challenge ahead of us is to reduce emissions and get to net zero. So that is the challenge that um, I think we're, we're focused on solving here at Heliogen. Over half of all of climate change related emissions is caused by a set of sectors related to transportation 
industry um, and energy consumption. And those emissions, in many cases, there are lots of companies that are looking to do something about those, but there is a whole subsector where there is not really a place that's addressed, and that's industrial emissions. And that's the, that's the challenge that um, Heliogen is really focused on. So for those who are unfamiliar with the company, can you introduce us to Heliogen and why specifically this company is going to help alleviate the problem that you've just enunciated? Absolutely. So Heliogen is all about industrial decarbonization, and we have a unique technology solution to it. I think people are generally familiar with solar PV and wind as examples of renewable energy and ways of powering the world that don't burn fossil fuels. What Heliogen's technology does is it takes the fundamental um, aspects of thermal energy from the sun, as opposed to um, the electrical side of that, which is solar PV, it takes solar thermal energy and concentrates that and leverages that thermal energy to deploy it into multiple forms. And so we can use it in its native form as heat or as steam. Mm -hmm. We can add a turbine to produce power. We can also do things like adding an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. And so Heliogen's technology, what makes it unique, because concentrated solar thermal exists elsewhere in the world already. There are already examples of where this is deployed globally at, at commercial and industrial scale. What's unique about Heliogen is the fact that we use a combination of artificial intelligence along with novel hardware combined to make a solution that up levels our ability to do this with concentrated solar thermal. Yeah. And for those who haven't gone to the Heliogen website, it's a heliostat effectively. I may be using the terminology improperly and I'll let you help us with all the lexicon that we need okay. for this. And we'll, we'll dig deep into that later on in the interview as well. I have a whole section on, uh, on specifically the, the language that we use to, to enable these technologies to move. But concentrating solar is not something that most of our peers are thinking about. Right now, you know, when many of us, you included, were getting into the industry, late teens, or, or excuse me, late aughts, early teens, um, you know, Ivanpah had been built, um, many, many examples, a dozen or more in Spain and around the world, uh, stood as examples of um, sort of refinement in how concentrating solar works and can be used. Companies like Soul Focus um, also tried taking different approaches, and we could name on and on. Um, one question that stands out for me is why now is the time to rethink concentrating solar? Isn't flat plate solar already addressing the needs that we have for harnessing the sun? Oh, what a great question. Um, so maybe let me first, if it's okay, give people a little bit of background on what concentrated solar is. Yeah. The concentrated solar energy, it basically, in a nutshell, it offers a very efficient, cost-effective solution to, to decarbonize with long duration energy storage. And these are previously untouched areas that can help industrial operations. When most people think of solar energy, we talked about, they think of solar PV, but what concentrated solar energy is, it's essentially a field of mirrors. And you're right, we call them heliostats, which basically just mirrors the track the sun. And this field of mirrors basically behaves like a huge magnifying glass. Um, those mirrors reflect and focus the sunlight onto a what we call a receiver at the top of a tower. And this is all made of materials that can absorb heat at very high temperatures. And um, at the end of that, there can be various forms of storage. Um, there are forms of storage that are commercially available. There are ones that are in development. But in any case, the forms of storage then take the heat and store it in a storage medium. And then you can dispatch it and release it when the sun isn't shining. And therefore, it solves the challenge of intermittency, which is faced by other types of renewable energy. Gotcha. So what I heard you say is that concentrating solar, because it allows us to magnify the sun's um, power, gives us a chance to simultaneously harness the sun and store the power in one unit, effectively, in one, um, in one conversion cycle. Is that right? Exactly. I mean, there's okay. the beauty of it is, especially if you're using to apply for heat, there's no conversion loss, which you would face if you started with electricity first and then converted to heat. 
Um, yeah. It's also not, as we mentioned, a brand new technology. It exists in, and it's been deployed at scale many places all over the world. It was the, it was the first application of, of, of harnessing sunlight was reflecting the sun and, and actually using it to heat elements in many, in many different forms, and among them water. You know, you introduced, I know that you guys, um, I've seen some of the early videos um, and it's a little circumspect because I imagine there's some IP around okay, exactly how, what you're heating, what the medium is. Um, there's been lots of talk about salt. I recall an early video with Bill Gross talking about rocks. How have you all uh, innovated around, um, you know, I'm also intrigued by, and I want to roll this into the question because I just had um, Robert from Energy Vault on. I'm intrigued by this concept of innovating around the actual uh, the way we store the power and the medium through it, the medium we use, right? Um, so where is this heat being captured and harnessed in a heliogen generator? Right. Um, so we have a number of different uh, solutions. There are some that are commercially available and ready now. And those are actually very, um, you know, they're they're accessible, they're proven, they're already deployed at scale. And those are solutions such as molten salt and steam accumulator. Those are all examples of things that have been proven, deployed at commercial scale, high technology readiness. And then when we look at how we are innovating for the future, the holy grail of industrial carbon emissions reduction lies in being able to offset emissions from industrial heat and high temperature processes mm. like cement and steel. Um, one stat that really struck me was seeing that Cement is the second most consumed material in the world after water, which yeah. you know kind of blows your mind. Yeah. And so recognizing that it takes high temperature to process cement, and currently the only viable commercially um, economic way to do that is by burning fossil fuels, um, this becomes a, a key area where in the long term we can focus. So let me bring it back to your question on storage. We have a storage technology that we're developing and that we're actually currently building a project for um, along with our, our partner, Woodside Energy and customer. Um, and that project uses a novel form of storage. It's a, it's a um, particle technology. And so the, these particles, it's basically a bauxite, one millimeter diameter particle. And uh, the particles are what sit in the receiver and provide the form of thermal energy storage. And the benefit of that is that you are able to get to higher temperatures with the particle storage than you can with other forms of storage. And that also in turn allows knock-on effects, positive knock-on effects for other things that are attractive, such as different and improved uh, um, turbine technology. So we can improve the efficiency of turbines by using things like supercritical CO2 and um, as opposed to steam. I mean, if you're familiar with steam turbine technology, that's been around forever. What is on the cutting edge is um, using a supercritical CO2 turbine, which allows you several percentage um, points increase in efficiency. And so that's the basis of one of our, our core um, early projects that we're working on. If my eyes look like they're glazing over the way yours did when I talked about um, camera um, <laughs> refinement, <laughs> just let the, the listener appreciate the fact that you know way more about this technology yeah, than I do. Yeah. So I'm, I feel like I'm still at like a kindergarten level trying to understand. I can throw in some smart comments because I've been in the industry for 17 years, but I know nothing about, um, so like, you know, how the materials work. Um, so I probably will come back and ask what may seem like elementary question. I apologize for that, but this is super, I, I want to be able to come away from this, um, Having changed my mind, when someone says, what have you changed your mind about lately? It will probably be um, that that's, that concentrating solar isn't dead. Before this conversation, if somebody asked me, I would have said concentrating solar is dead. And I want, um, I want you through this interview to prove me wrong. One of the things that I also believe is very important for any technology to thrive is that we have to own terminology that resonates, right? And if, if nothing else, like... Great companies do this um, very, very well um, alongside great, great product creation. They're able to coin terminology. And one thing that I learned recently that I had not uh, heard anywhere else that I think was introduced by Heliogen, um, you know, around 2020, 2021 is the concept of, and I want to applaud you for this, sunlight refinery. Uh, why? Because 
we can all wrap our heads around what a refinery is and what it's for and how it has served the purpose of uh, our industrial civilization for the last hundred plus years. Along the lines of sunlight refinery, how else are you helping folks kind of think about the process that Heliogen offers for energy transition compared with flat plate solar collectors and wind turbines? Sure. Um, one example that we also like to talk about is more more bits, fewer atoms. I think people can kind of get their mind around if there's more material, more equipment, you end up with higher cost. And the more you can use software and things that are in the you know artificial intelligence space to help drive down costs and help drive down materials, that's certainly a positive that we are bringing to this um, this iteration of, of concentrating solar thermal. With fewer atoms, what is it that is being reduced or stripped out of the process? So, for example, if you look at the prior generation heliostats, um, the mirrors that track the sun and concentrate the solar energy, you had to keep them extremely stiff and you end up, to do that, building in more steel because you didn't want it, other than the, the six tracking paths um, across, uh, tracking the sun across the sky, you didn't want it to have this flexibility to be able to you know, move at any given time with the wind or with storms or as the ground settles. And so with our technology, the, the crux of our, um, our innovation from a software perspective is a closed loop feedback system where the mirrors for the first time can talk to the tower and have a, a, a recognition process of when the mirror needs to be adjusted in real time. So they're self-adjusting the way we have like a self-healing Wi-Fi mesh network. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a great wow, analogy. That's really cool. So uh, two things I wanted to point out, um, just sort of informational for, um, for folks listening, is cement. Um, coincidentally, we talked about this in several of our interviews in, um, in Las Vegas because hard to bait industries, steel and cement among them. Um, are the target for these industrial processes. And cement represents nearly 8% of global CO2 emissions. Nearly 8%, which is an unfathomable. I mean, if you think about, I, 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 we, um, I, it stacks up with like all of automobiles, right? Industrial, like buildings have a higher um, contribution, but I'm pretty sure that automobiles are only somewhere in the like 10 to 15% range. Like that's, incredible that the, that the process for creating one of our fundamental building blocks literally is um, almost 10% of our global CO2 emissions. So, so the folks can kind of wrap their head around the scale. And we mentioned it, and I don't have the stat of what steel represents, but we mentioned it in our green hydrogen series, which I would love for folks to listen to. In fact, the director of commercialization for uh, Linda Corporation um, gave a lot of stats on the steel industry and its contribution to global emissions. If folks want to go back and listen to that, that was like December of 2021, if I remember. We'll try to link to it in the show notes. Another point, why does it matter that the mirrors, um, if anybody has seen some of the failed mirror or sort of power tower plants, it's because the heliostats do get blown off off kilter and and there's a manual process for adjusting and realigning them on, in most cases. I remember when a friend of mine's son was working at, um, I, I can't remember, what was the, there was a company that worked, it was in Silicon Valley, it was green something, and they were like solar, fo solar focus, they like tracked the sun and concentrated onto a really small thing. And he said that the margin of error for concentrating solar uh, array is less than 1%. It's like 0.03%. Yes. Of, talking is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking milliradians of adjustment and so yes it's an extremely I'm sorry what's that what's the term milliradians yeah yeah so oh that's my a, gosh a measure of the accuracy required but yeah it is it is extremely um it requires extreme precision yeah and and you know you asked about talked about why now right because mm. some people who have been in the solar industry will probably remember um, the what's now considered a, a mixed or a failed track record of prior generation of solar thermal projects in the U.S. Um, again, notwithstanding the fact that there are others operating elsewhere, but people may wonder, why should we re revive this technology now? Well, um, first of all, it is important to consider that concentrating solar is right now being built all over the world in places like Morocco, Chile, Spain, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, 
um, and a lot in China as well, because those countries have recognized the inherent advantage that this technology offers with thermal energy storage. And they didn't just stop after one or two projects. Imagine if we encountered an execution challenge with solar PV and just stopped deploying it in the US. That would have been a bad idea. And so now is the time. There are a couple of things that have changed both in the technology and the landscape that um, lead us to the conclusion that now is the time. Let's revive it. Let's bring it back to the US. Uh, we are the only domestic provider of commercial scale um, solar, concentrating solar technology, which is also really exciting. And so I can get a little bit more specific if, if this is good on um, yeah, go why now is the right time. Okay. Yeah. So I think in the past, uh, as solar PV was on its very rapid, rapid downward trajectory and cost, that was around the time that there's a couple of um, concentrating solar projects in the US were actually being built. They were reaching final investment decisions. They were getting started and under construction underway. And at the time, from a um, kind of commercial uh, standpoint with utilities, there was a lot of direct comparison between concentrating solar thermal and daytime solar PV, and that completely misses the point. Mm. The benefit of concentrating solar is that we can make it dispatchable with this built-in thermal energy storage. Um, I like to call it a thermal battery, basically. People know what a battery is. They're used yeah. to chemical form of batteries or lith lithium-ion. We have essentially a thermal battery, and that has be better economics than battery storage if you can get the temperature there. In the prior decade, when concentrating solar was deployed in the U.S., at that time, capacity value or the idea of dispatchability and storage was more of an afterthought. You did not see RFPs coming out looking for long-duration energy storage, and as grid's penetration of renewable energy has increased, that has become a prevailing element of RFPs all over the country. And so now is the time to look at alternatives to the standard um, lithium ion battery. Now I'm, I'm fully a believer in all of the above being needed for, um, for hitting that zero, but thermal energy storage is gonna be such an important component of being successful. In the very beginning, you brought up AI and I feel that the introduction of AI may itself be an underlying element of the answer to the question I want to ask next. But I think that timing is everything. And one of the points that you made just now is that when we were developing large scale solar a decade plus ago, the utilities simply were unwilling to consider capacity as a concept for solar technology. They, there wasn't enough um, shared experience. There wasn't they they had already built <laughs> five, 10 year um, uh, plans for the grid. Um, and as they, as the technology has proven itself out now and with batteries coming online, we see that we are looking at renewables to be dispatchable, to have capacity payments. And we're seeing mm -hmm. Tesla and others get capacity payments, which is a miraculous by most standards for those of us who have been in the industry long enough to see it happen. Um, I, I still, I get folks sending me screenshots of, um, of their Tesla Powerwall being, called upon in mm -hmm. California. And they're just like, this is magic. You said this was going to happen. It's happening. <laughs> um, along that line, um, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about AI with any like modicum of seriousness, certainly not within the energy sector that we, within the renewable energy sector, oil and gas was because they were using it uh, in, in very specific ways. What needed to be true then back to long window way of getting to my question, what needed to be true for the business that you're in right now? There work. are a couple of things. Uh, it's a great question. There are a couple of things that happened um, in the recent years that allowed this to happen. One important thing for our technology is the invention, the innovation of the NVIDIA GP processor. Okay. And so the, the work that we do and the way that we um, structure our pointing technology, and this is part of our, our patent um, protected portfolio uh, of IP, we have technology that essentially has a closed feedback loop. And so the relationship, the mechanism that allows the mirrors and the tower to basically talk to each other and constantly be auto-adjusting and improving the way in which we auto-adjust, that's something that was only made possible by this additional processing um, speed and capacity. And so that's, that's one thing that I think um, had to be true. And then I think another thing that had to be true was we had the lessons learned of past iterations of this technology and a recognition that what, what didn't work before has to be solved. And that's why I was so excited to come to Heliogen. Who do you sell to? What problems do you solve for those clients? 
Yes. Um, for clients, it can be anything ranging from long duration energy storage for power where they need 24 seven power that's green in order to hit decarbonization objectives, or it can be using um, clean steam to replace existing steam in industrial processes, things like that. So there, there are many different kinds of applica um, applications that um, we will eventually be looking to hit, but those are two um, near term examples. Clean, clean and clean power. Are you building these alongside industrial facilities then? I mean, typically these are built by out in the middle of the desert. For anything related to heat and steam, because heat and steam don't travel well, the typical source of production of the heat or steam is sited physically right adjacent to the facility that consumes it. And that's not unique to Heliogen. That's for any um, operation that is being a supplier of heat or steam. And so for us, yes, absolutely. That would be kind of like equivalent of a behind the meter kind of steam um, operation. But when, as we are looking at that, it does involve integration with a customer's existing facility. And so we target customers and uh, facilities that do have access to land um, adjacent. And so there are some that get ruled out, such as food processing facilities in the middle of urban areas. I mean, that, that wouldn't be a, a, a good fit. But there are tons of areas in the mining sector and in other, many other industries where we do have that strong fit of strong solar resource, available land, and a customer with a need to decarbonize urgently at an economic price. Well, it takes a tremendous amount of research, development, capital to bring a product like this to market. Not only have you been able to bring the product into the delivery phase, working with reputable energy companies to bring this technology into the field, tr test and move into more high production scale, um, but you've been able to take the company public. Can you talk about the path to commercialization for Heliogen to date? What did it take financially to lift this product out of the out of the sort of the the off the workbench and um and then let's talk a bit about the decision to take it public through SPAC. Absolutely. So in the early stages of the company, the company was actually founded in around 2013 and like any uh like any startup went through multiple reincarnations and pivots and start at the beginning and those kinds of uh, events throughout the company's life. But in the current iteration of this technology, one of the key launching events was the startup of our demonstration scale facility in California. So we have a facility um, that has our um, heliostats uh, tower and that software closed loop feedback technology using artificial intelligence that proved for the first time that the core IP Heliogen has developed works. And so that was the point where when you look at kind of points of acceleration, now you can start to have the conversation of, okay, let's talk about commercializing. So that was an exciting time and that happened in uh, late 2019. That was uh, you know about a year before, a little over a year before I joined the company. So through building that demonstration facility, how much money did uh, Heliogen have to raise to get to that point? Um, over the course of, you know, maybe I'll, I'll zero it down to pre-public. So um, prior to um, taking the company public at the end of 2021, in total, the company raised uh, over $100 million in funding through a number of various small rounds of funding, starting with the earliest stage of um, in 2013, getting, you know, a million dollars from uh, small family and friends type uh, and venture capital fund type investors. What was the underlying decision around timing and specific vehicle to take the company public? The company had at that point proven that the core technology works. And at the time, like you said, the stock market was really booming. And I think at any given point, um, and in fact, in the prior decades, there were something like an average of a couple of SPAC or DSPACs uh, that were done per year leading up to this point where it, there was really a boom and I think it was a couple hundred that, um, that launched that way. Um, but for us, you know, you're, you, you come to a crossroads where you're looking at what are the most effective um, 
vehicles that you could use to raise capital. And there was, uh, when we when we were approached by the SPAC to look at this opportunity, it was surely actually around the time that I arrived at the company. And so that was a very um, exciting path to be on, uh, having to quickly prepare for uh, the public event. Um, as, but the I'll say that, as, as the CFO, absolutely. Um, but, you know, looking at the uh, where the company was, the fact that we're in this space of trying to solve for climate change and being able to have a vehicle that gives people public access was one of actually the appealing factors of it. Because now you have a platform where, you know, people, it's mainstream now, people recognize that climate change is real. People want to find a way to participate. And so this is one way, you know, through the, the DSPAC um, approach that, um, that you can do that. I want to touch one more one more point, I guess, on the SPAC and the importance of it as a milestone in the in Heliogen's progress so far. At the point that you actually finally converted and and went public, um, it was not at the height or the apex of SPAC interest. It was as SPAC interest was waning, and there were examples of of bad um, SPACs that didn't produce results. Nevertheless, you completed the deal. Uh, could you talk about, as the then CFO who stepped in to become the CEO, um, the results of the SPAC and how it set you up for what you guys are working on today? To your point, our DSPAC event happened at a point where the bubble in the SPAC market, you could say, had burst. And there are a lot of companies that either ended up not being able to follow through on a deal or that were left without anything meaningful to be added to their balance sheet because they had, you know, all of their redemptions and then they also didn't have a strong uh, pipe to close them out. And we were fortunate that, you know, through the strength of what our offering could bring, we still got a strong pipe investment and got 160 million plus onto the balance sheet through the DSPAC. Um, so I think, you know, from a from the standpoint of, did that give us enough runway to begin our story? The answer is yes. Now, was it, was it a suboptimal outcome because of the timing of the market? Absolutely. But we were very fortunate and pleased that we were able to bring that capital onto the balance sheet so that at least we could kick off our story and hit the ground running. Christy, I want to know, did you grow up in an environment where entrepreneurship seemed like a foregone conclusion? What, what was the nature of your family environment? Yeah, so I grew up in a very curiosity encouraging um, household, and it was a multicultural household. My father came from Nigeria. He immigrated to go to school here. My mother is from St. Louis, Missouri, and they had very different uh, professional backgrounds too. My father was an engineer by training, and my mother was a social worker. They're both retired now. Um, but so we had a very, um, I would say, uh, a, a background of abundant love and otherwise we were lower middle class, lower middle class, um, you know, didn't have a lot of financial means, but my parents really invested in me in terms of the time that they spent and, you know, the, the opportunities that they gave me access to. You know, what a, what a testament to the courage uh, and diligence of um, both, both your parents, but your father immigrating from Africa to um, pursue higher education to pursue a better life for, for him and his family to see his daughter not only go off to study at an, a prestigious institution like MIT, but to then, um, you know, rise in the ranks to the C-suite and ultimately the CEO of a publicly traded company is kind of a dream come true for the family, I would imagine. Yeah, they're, they're very excited. And I think when, when, um, when I think about what my dreams were uh, as a kid and the things that my parents always told me you can go and do. I can't imagine working on something more exciting that's more aligned mm -hmm. with, with those dreams. Is there a career path that you, or maybe they thought you'd go down, but you ultimately abandoned? Um, I think it was always something that would be scientific or technical in nature. Um, I think that that was always kind of on the horizon. I mean, even when I was a, a young kid, um, my father would always pull me away from a perspectives, uh, TV entertainment, and bring me into the backyard. And we'd do science experiments on the in our backyard. And so I 
from an early age, learned about forming hypotheses and doing those kinds of things, which is, I think, a, a great foundation. That is amazing. Uh, kudos to your father for being active and diligent, involved, not uh, not letting um, not letting technology take care of you, <laughs> as yeah, so many absolutely. as so many children. Um, that is their reality right now. I wonder along the way, though, if there were uh, just interesting detours. I think that everything we do builds on top of other uh, activity. So were there early jobs that you kind of laugh about now? I, I think that, you know, there still are stepping stones and skill sets, pattern matching that we develop. I'm curious about your reflection on the early, the early things that you would call jobs or ways that you earned money. Yeah. Um, I said growing up, babysitting had a big role in my, in my life, um, just for neighborhood kids. Uh, when I was in uh, college, I worked in a, um, a cell biology lab. And then coming out of college, I think one of the formative uh, roles that I took was at a multinational consumer goods company, Procter & Gamble. And, you know, having come from a, a multicultural household and gone to a, you know, a, a public school with people from all walks of life, I was very comfortable in places where um, you know, there's a lot of diversity and you, you figure out ways to interact with people of all different backgrounds. And that was certainly, um, helpful and expanded upon in my time at, at Procter & Gamble because I was responsible for deploying and scaling up, um, manufacturing processes all over the world. And so that was very formative for me and, um, something that, uh, in terms of kind of, uh, building discipline into work processes and those kinds of things, um, a really good shaping, um, shaping path. I'm glad you brought up Procter & Gamble. It was your first role out of undergrad. Um, a lot of folks don't give enough credence to that first seminal job experience in terms of the skill stacking. Are there things that you now in your executive function can, can attribute to the things that you learned early on at such a massive company? And I'll, I'll note that I've told many aspiring uh uh, college graduates who say, oh, I want to go work at a startup. My advice is always, always don't go work at Procter & Gamble. Let them move you, the very smart person, around to every function they'll give you and do that for three to five years. Then go to a utility and just like suck it up for the next five to eight years at a big, a big uh, non-industry company that will teach you executive function or at a McKinsey and then go work at a utility and Learn how the power sector works because they'll teach you. It'll be part of your job. And then you take that and go work for a startup and you'll be paid better and you'll know how you have much more idea of how to apply those skills. So with that in mind, could you map for me what uh, that early four years at Procter & Gamble did for you? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's exactly how I feel and exactly what happened. Um, I, one of the early things that a mentor told me was say yes whenever possible when you're asked to go on a different assignment or do or change in. Um, and one of those things was I spent um, uh, a while in Japan working on uh, a new uh, consumer product. And I think that was a really key shaping experience in terms of, you know, building in that the people element is so critical to everything at any level, but all the more so at the senior executive level. Because at the end of the day, you're counting and relying on people to roll up their sleeves and be delivering results. And that was something that I really um, started to understand in that role um, at Procter & Gamble. I remember from a previous call with you that you, and you mentioned being low, lower middle income family, that it wasn't possible earlier in your life to go back and visit your father's homeland. Um, yet having the opportunity to do so in college uh, and afterwards, and it ignited in you what ultimately became the spark that led you to the energy sector. Could you walk me through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so once uh, I started working, um, our family was able to make the first trip as a family, actually, um, to my father's hometown in Nigeria. And, um, you know, we still have a lot of family there. And so I met many family members for the first time, which was wonderful. Um, and then on top of that, from a kind of exposure and professional standpoint, it just, it really prompted my um, career shift. Um, as we talked about, I had a great time and experience and learning at Procter & Gamble, but seeing in Nigeria firsthand, the impacts that unreliable, expensive fossil fuel energy had on people's livelihoods 
um, and ability to have economic development and growth, that was something that really um, fueled my interest in alternative forms of energy. Um, and to be clear, I've spent a good portion of my career in both traditional and renewable. And I'm a big fan of, you know, having a just transition. That's all very important. But that was really the spark that led me to go you know, back to business school with a focus on um, renewable and alternative forms of energy. So you spent a decade at Bechtel. And for those who are unfamiliar, Bechtel is a major infrastructure construction firm, like very, very well respected. And you rose to the level of being the chief financial officer and principal vice president for the energy sector for Bechtel. Um, talk about that. I mean, a decade at Bechtel is tremendous um, for, for any uh, ascension in, uh, in industry. I had a, a wonderful experience there. Um, I, at Bechtel, when I started out, it was right after completing my MBA at MIT Sloan. And I joined actually because I had learned about the Bright Source Island Pulp project that they were no working way. on. Yes. Yeah. And so in so many ways, I think this is really uh, kind of meant to be a come full circle here. Um, I learned about that. I didn't work on it, but I remember going up in one of the towers while a, yeah. another tower was under construction. And it was just such a thrilling feeling to be part of this um, cutting edge uh, application of renewable energy. And so I started out in Bechtel's um, investment and development, project development arm, and you know spent some time uh, developing uh, solar PV projects while I was there, um, and also leading the financial analysis group, and then transitioned into a series of different um, rotational roles, um, with increasing your responsibility over the course of the next um, many years. And what the, the most, probably the most um, uh, crucible role that I had was in a boots on the ground construction project where I was in, you know, walking around the site and, you know, working in, in the unit and, and looking at, um, you know, controls of the plant uh, as it was being built. And it, it kind of goes back to your opening quote um, about the tricks of the trade versus the trade and just really understanding the core business of whatever company or whatever effort you're in. I think that's so important. Did you ask for those rotations or were you nominated for them? Um, both, in fact. I mean, I, I put my hand up and said, you know, I want to ultimately be working on uh, energy projects. But at the end of the day, I'm open to different experiences. And uh, the, the experience there, I think, was that it's very common, even at the most senior level, for there to be a constant revolving door of people being in you know, corporate or executive positions and then back on projects because Bechtel as a company really values that um, you know, in the machine core business experience. Um, so yes, and then I was, I was nominated um, to do various leadership growth assignments and that is actually one of them. It's, it's being on a, a, an active construction job. I love it. I mean, I didn't know this about your Bechtel journey, but how it perfectly underscores what I just said about the key. I mean, it's so important. People think that people are so distracted by the lust, uh, the luster of the startup world. And thanks to a lot of the incentives that were created during the Obama administration, we, we now have the capacity for everyone to be an entrepreneur. And it is in fact, the American dream. But what most people forget is that most successful entrepreneurs have some level of corporate experience prior to going off into entrepreneurship. Like it's a rare, rare, rare bird. You know, even, um, I mean, you look at the success of Bezos. Bezos had deep, deep industry experience. Was it Hand and Armstrong? I can't remember. It's one of those like, um, it's one of the companies that actually is a big investor in, um, in solar right now. It's not Hand and it's the other one. Um, D.E. Shaw. Who's a D.E. Shaw? How do I remember that? Anyway. Like, it's just, it underscores the fact that like, go, go get the freaking experience like Christy did. Um, and, and it, it's just an accelerant. It's like, it's like being pulled back in a slingshot. And when you get there and the right, right opportunity will come along. So how did the opportunity come along for Heliogen? Yeah, I was, um, I was working on things that were interesting to me at Bechtel and having a very positive experience there. I was not actually looking for a new opportunity, but when uh, Healy Gen reached out through a recruiter and 
I remember I was um, in my kitchen chopping something, chopping vegetables for dinner because I, it was positioned to me as a um, an advice for CFO role through a, um, a mutual acquaintance. And I got on the phone and I was not on video. And by the time we got five minutes into the conversation and they were describing the opportunity, I ran upstairs, took off the apron and was in front of the video trying to learn more. So it was just a, it was um, such a, such a clear potential once in a lifetime you know, opportunity to be part of something where there's a differentiated technology on a problem that I'm so passionate about already. I just thought, you know, you get these maybe once in a blue moon. So let me jump onto this. All right. Thanks to the magic of technology and DoorDash, we are going to jump into what is uh, a part two. Although for you, only a few nanoseconds have passed for Christy and I, an entire day has passed. Christy, it, uh, it's good to always get a second shot to ask good questions. So thank you for jumping back in so that we could finish what I think is a very, very interesting interview. Absolutely. Nico, thanks for having me back. Indeed, indeed. Um, and if we, uh, I'm, I'm saying this mostly for those, you know, three of you, my mom and two others for sure, who are watching on YouTube that, uh, that you can tell the, the, the background has changed at least, but you know, Christy and I are dedicated to the craft store, even wearing the same shirts. Um, Christy, I want to jump back to sort of the application of the technology. And as I read through the, uh, yes, if you're a publicly traded company, you've published a lot about how you plan to execute on the technology that you're putting in the field now, back in 21, as you were starting to go public, the, the underlying design of the system was really predicated on this modularity, this five megawatt plant that you could replicate and that would, um, that would basically take the space of, um, you know, one, one twentieth of a traditional solar plant, if you think about it that way, right? One sixth of a square mile, um, and about a million kilograms of hydrogen could be produced from that. Uh, how has the product and the company evolved over the last three years now that you are into product market fit, you're into the commercialization phase of the product. Yeah, Nico, that's exactly right. We do see the shift and we see that as we're evolving our product market fit and continuing to get feedback from customers, we get to focus on what are the must-haves for a customer. And you're exactly right. Um, we have focused on a modular um, execution of our technology but we found that, that the most important aspect of the tech is really our ability to, A, be long duration, because today the only ways to make renewable energy long duration is to use batteries, which still tend to be cost prohibited at long uh, hours of energy storage. And then B, we start out as thermal energy. And so for heat and those kinds of applications, we are the most efficient way to get energy to the end user because we already start out as heat. So those are some examples of where our technology is really different. You're using a term that a lot of folks uh, in renewables are now becoming more familiar with, and that's long duration energy storage. And earlier we captured how it is in fact storing this, ca this capacity and the energy to provide power, heat, and other formats. What, what for heliogen does long duration represent? And I mean, give me an hour quotient, right? Because batteries yeah. often talk in terms of hours for long versus short duration. That's right. So typically we're looking at things like 10 hours of energy storage is what a customer will be looking for. And you can contrast that with uh, more typically in the PV plus battery space, you see four hours or shorter right. duration. It's very, very common. Um, and so we're able to really bridge that gap with our longer ability to store and make that cost effective. So I'd like to spend the bulk of the time that we have left really digging into the connections between the technology you've created, the, the company um, sort of nexus as what I would consider to be a, an alternative to think about how we can leverage the sun, how we can leverage technology. A lot of folks, as I said in the outset, would prior to this conversation probably believe concentrated in solar is, is dead and uh, PV has won. So you've, you've got a mission as an organization. And as you deploy this technology, there are very specific applications. I'd like to know where is Heliogen ideally suited that other renewables, frankly, are not. And I'd love it if you could give us some examples, some recent 
project or offtake agreements that exemplify how the technology is being used by customers? Sure. Yeah. So our core technology, really, if you look at what the commercial applications are, uh, some of the strongest use cases are across various industrial and business um, examples. You know, power for business operations, heat or steam for industrial processes, um, and also energy to support the production of clean hydrogen. And so we have examples on uh, on these different areas where we are using our tech today. Um, one of those examples is we actually recently signed an offtake agreement with the city of Lancaster, California, for using Heliogen's technology to fuel an electrolyzer to produce green hydrogen. So we're very excited about that as uh, one of the first applications of our tech. That is fantastic. That is with the city. So is it with a particular, what what segment of the city? Yeah, great question. It's, it's with the municipality and it's for <laughs> fueling municipal vehicles and supporting regional hydrogen demand. The city, city of Lancaster, Lancaster is, wait, they're going to have a fleet of hydrogen vehicles? That is their intent. And they're That's really, amazing. You know, we, we totally share their, their vision and are excited to partner with them on helping yeah. be one of the visionary cities that's yeah. early on the, the hydrogen forefront. <laughs> this episode not sponsored by Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's fantastic. I haven't heard of a city making a commitment to hydrogen fleets and not that they haven't. I just haven't been exposed to it, but that is really cool. So the could you walk me through how the heliogen process is a better suited technology for the city to get to hydrogen for their fleet? Sure. So our technology allows us to produce steam and power, and that actually makes it very well suited for providing energy to a solid oxide electrolyzer, which is one of the many types of electrolyzers that exist. The benefit of being able to provide steam to the electrolyzer is that steam is generally cheaper to produce than power. And so by being able to receive steam as an input, solid oxide electrolyzers have a really great advantage that can help them potentially become uh, the most effective electrolyzer on the market. So we're really excited for that opportunity. We can actually work with any electrolyzer, but that's an area where we have a distinct advantage because of the fact that we produce steam and power. Yeah, is I, we could use a whole Tactical Tuesday kind of deep dive on electrolyzers because I that is a such a confusing, um, area of the industry right now. I feel like a lot of folks are coming at um, the creation of hydrogen from different angles. You know, there's electrolysis and pyrolysis and there's oxide electrolyzer. So we could go deep down a rabbit hole. I'm not going to ask you to do that. What I want to do instead is kind of back out for a second and look at other examples that um, show customer engagement for the technology, but in slightly different realms. And again, it's back to the question, where is Heliogen better suited than other renewables for these customer applications? Um, and I, I know that you've got at least one project that we uh, have talked about offline, Project Brenda, and I'd love to hear that and others. Yeah, sure. So Brenda, Project Brenda is a project that's in development in the state of Arizona. Um, we won this uh, special solar energy zone, which means that there's, um, it's, a, it's an expedited permitting process. And we're also very fortunate that at that site, we have access to um, water, which is, which is one of the things that you need to make green hydrogen because it's basically putting the water molecule. And so that's an exciting site that we're developing a project on right now. We have the ability to make that a combination of power and hydrogen. We're currently developing it as a hydrogen project. And we've received a lot of um, interest from uh, equity participants and strategics um, on that front. And that's another example where, you know, because of the fact that we have long duration energy storage, hydrogen facilities, especially when you get to the cryo and the cold processing of hydrogen, they need 24 seven energy. And so that's another example of where Heliogen's technology can make a difference. Um, I'll talk about another project. We have a project called Capella, which is with our customer Woodside Energy, um, Woodside is the largest um, oil and gas producer in the, the country of Australia. And our relationship with them, they've been a great partner for us. And right now we're making progress on our commercial scale um, project with them for deploying uh, our tech to generate power. So it's a five megawatt facility in California. And uh, it will actually be a key milestone for the CSP industry. 
because it actually uses a next generation storage technology. And it's part of our um, overall technology roadmap. Okay. So this is utilizing the, what we talked about earlier, sort of the patented um, proprietary storage materials that you all are innovating around. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a concept where it's something that builds on other things that are in operation today. But what's unique about it is, remember, we talked about the field of mirrors that point the sun's rays at the top of the tower. There's plenty of existing technologies that do that and are already deployed in commercial operation. This one, the, the reason why I call this next generation is because it allows you to reach higher temperatures by, and it's still using material that's um, readily available. So it's bauxite particle, basically a precursor to aluminum, but it's, it's basically like sand or rocks, that kind of thing. Um, and so you can use that material to reach higher temperatures and therefore enable other advanced technologies that all lead to producing energy at higher efficiency. As you and your commercial team are reaching out and sharing the vision for Heliogen, the applications that are possible, where do you find that customers or even partners like Woodside get most excited? Uh, really a combination of things. It's the the potential for 24-7 power and heat, you know, most industrial processes and even many businesses operate 24 seven. And when they're, when they're setting their aggressive goals for decarbonization, one of their greatest challenges is the fact that most renewable energy is intermittent. And so when the sun's not shining, the wind isn't blowing, there's no energy. And like we talked about, batteries aren't yet cost competitive over long durations. And so that's where they get the most excited. And then what I'd say is uh, the other area is um, what I like to refer to as the holy grail of, um, of decarbonization, which is to be able to address and serve the high temperature industrial processes that currently are underserved by green energy solutions. So those are uh, processes like cement production, steel manufacturing, and those kinds of things. When we talk about long duration and uh, green hydrogen as a byproduct you know, we mentioned earlier that you need something like 90 to 95% utilization rate of the asset before hydrogen really starts to pencil. Mm -hmm. And at 10 hours, I guess I'm just, I need your help here. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the 24 seven element because at 10 hours, given the precision required for a heliostat, I'm still not seeing 24 hours of continuous generation or, or yeah. maybe I'm missing something. I'm not a scientist here. No, no, you're, you're doing the math right. So um, the 10 hours is an example. Mm -hmm. Some customers are, um, you know, their, their needs are served by 10 hours of storage. But if you wanted to get the full utilization, you'd have something like, you know, the eight hours plus or minus of direct solar energy during the day. And then the rest of it re really would be um, dispatchable and, and even longer than 10 hours at night to get to right. get up to four hours. And so Got we it. basically, you know, we can be flexible. We partner with customers to look at what the best um, kind of mix is for them and what the kind of trade-offs are. Mm -hmm. And then we can build in technologies that um, allow us to utilize things that help us flush out that long duration storage. So the fact yeah. that basically a thermal battery instead of a lithium ion battery means that we're the, the cheapest solution for storing um, energy overnight. Yes, and the cheapest solution for converting sunlight into hydrogen directly. <laughs> so I love that. And we talked, we covered that earlier. I appreciate that actually was something I learned in this interview. The, um, what occurs to me as well, just that the project developer in me says, okay, great. Well, we know we can hedge, um, we can buy on the open market, um, renewable green power mm -hmm. that allows us to claim green hydrogen for the let's say four to six hours that we aren't purely generating on-site clean energy, or we could co-locate with wind in a mm -hmm. place like Oaxaca or central Texas, um, and parts of Nebraska and North Dakota. Um, those are all possible. I'm just thinking about the applications. If I'm a project developer listening here and I'm developing solar projects is, you know, like Woodside Energy is developing oil and gas projects. This mm -hmm. seems like just another uh, tool for me. It seems like a way, if I've got land and interconnection secured and I'm considering a thousand acres for flat plate solar, maybe I want to consider <laughs> a couple of acres 
uh, you know, what is it? 10 acres for the sixth of a quarter mile that you need. Yeah. So um, absolutely. It, it's, it's, I think it's a great way to look at it, to say it's another tool in the toolbox. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, it's the best tool when you look at what the requirements yeah. are for long duration storage, if there's a strong mm-hmm. resource and, yeah. you know, it, I'm a firm believer in all of the above. And sometimes you can see all of the above on the same site. Yeah. So we're, we're happy to, to yeah. partner with solar PV and to combine ourselves with PV such that you get the super low cost during the day. And then we become the cheap storage at night. There's all kinds of iterations that we can look at. I do think that there's sort of a misconception in the industry that um, because PV um, is present during the day and wind is prevalent at night, you can sort of create a firm product. Those two. But that doesn't actually make it firm. And I think we've seen a couple of RFPs globally um, where the outcome is, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a project awarded that combines PV and wind and a realization that you still need something to actually make it firm. And so yeah, this, like an energy trading company. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is the kind of area where we can come in. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. Have you, um, I was just interviewing Damien Beauchamp over at Eight Rivers and they've got their net power product, but he was talking about specifically, and this just occurs to me as something that, I don't know, you guys should talk to Eight Rivers for sure. Um, the, their process for carbon, for air carbon or carbon air capture is a perfect um, sort of coupling of this kind of technology with a 24 seven hydrogen production plant mm-hmm. because they're able to, uh, people should just listen to that interview, but it's it, the, the whole point that Damien brought up was that folks are grabbing sort of, they're, they're utilizing sort of dirty oxygen instead of clean oxygen. And they're looking at how to improve the efficiency of these, uh, of these molecule production facilities through clean oxygen. And I'm, it, it just made me think in that whole interview and listening to what you guys are working on that what we're really building towards is the capacity for all of these different plants to talk to one another and true scalable microgrids are the yeah. future, right? Yes. This is what's needed for grid resilience. And so that's yeah. some place that um, we can play. Uh, it, it is clear to me. And um, yeah, I've had, I mean, I'll, I'm going to bucket this similarly to a friend of mine who, Ryan, who left SunPower and he is super mm-hmm. gung-ho on small, small modular nuclear reactors, oh, yeah. which most of the renewables industry doesn't want to talk about. They want to call right. it renewable and they don't want to talk about the feasibility of it, but the reality is at a, in a in sort of, in sort of the the might for punch, right? Like the footprint required for a heliogen plant is um, given and and given the power and the storage that mm-hmm. it can yield. Um, assuming this, you know, the the technology commercializes with Woodside and others the way that it has been predicted and and is being built, I would say that you know, CSP is finally back. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is, we really believe that this is the perfect time for CSP to make a comeback. And that, you know, Heliogen has really elevated the old version of CSP. And so this is a perfect time to bring it back. And we can really actually serve industries and businesses that are looking to decarbonize. Yeah. And it comes back as well to kind of what was missing before. And you perfectly enunciated that earlier with the innovation around the kind of chipsets required for AI to work, the ability for technologists to put to put to work the all the you know decades of research around AI and the precision required for CSP um, simply needed the technology to catch up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As we wrap up, I'd love to get a little bit of sort of the inside of Christy Obiaya of how she operates. And part of that is I'm curious how mentors or guides in your life have influenced the direction for you. And specifically, I'd like if you could tailor that towards any particular advice or um, guidance or takeaway from a mentor that you routinely utilize. It inspires you and you pass it along to others as you now are mentoring. Hmm. Interesting question. There are, there are so many nuggets that I've been fortunate mm-hmm. to collect over the years. I had some really strong leaders that I got to work closely with at Bechtel, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, one of, one of these is, 
I would say probably to find a way to bring your best self to every challenge. And, you know, I, I truly believe that everyone that we work with has their own superpowers and finding ways to help empower people to use their superpowers is really what a leader can do best. You know, there's no, there's no skill set that I can encompass that uh, addresses everything that the, the team, the strong team around me is able to do. And so figuring out how to bring my best self and empowering others to use their superpowers is probably one, um, one piece that I, I leverage a lot. Do you have a way, have you come up with a mechanism for yourself to capture, account for, document those so that you, you, you're running a bigger and bigger team. And as it grows and Bechtel's giant company in, in itself, but as you lead others, how do you capture that and ensure that you come back around to it? You remember Brenda has this superpower and Marco has this other superpower. A lot of it, I think, is challenge specific. And so, you know, when I think about radical prioritization, I do think about things like, okay, in this chair, wearing the hat that I wear and with the skills that I have, there are certain things that I'm best positioned to be able to move forward, move the ball forward on. And other things where, okay, who on the team is best positioned to be player A? And so I, I do think about, um, you know, what are the best ways to leverage that? And I think it starts with what is the challenge that you're fundamentally trying to, trying to solve? You know, where can you radically prioritize? And so I think for me, it starts with outlining the objective and then figuring out who's on first. I love that. I use that all the time in my team, who's on first. Mm -hmm. um, and prioritization is key to, to achieving any goal and have the vision and then know how to decide what is the next best action. Um, I remember one of the earliest interviews I did with uh, Karen Barardo, um, her advice was regularly stop and ask yourself and the team, is this thing the next best thing that we should be working on? And if mm -hmm. not, we've got to pivot, pivot to that thing. Yes. Um, yeah. That's what I hear in your, um, the, the, the answer of radical prioritization. And I appreciate that because uh, as a leader, that's the only way you can get, get things done. That's right. Is there anything outside of work that just you geek out on, you nerd out on besides energy systems? Uh, you know, I have a great love for music. Um, mm. I, a lot of people in my family, most people in my family play instruments of some sort. Um, mm. My daughter's learning the harp. And so I'm kind of, you know, when you have a six-year-old that's learning the harp, you kind of learn it along with her. That's so right. those are some examples of where I geek out. Uh, lots of mm. different forms of music in my house. I play the violin and piano. Um, wow. And uh, I grew up with a lot of that. So I think that uh, leaders are readers and, and vice versa. I'd love to know if there is a particular book or few that have both impacted you or given you a different vision for leadership mm -hmm. or simply allowed you to distract your mind. And, and as a result, you routinely recommend or gift them. Oh yeah. So one that is very um, relevant to this, to today's topic is a book called Speed and Scale by John mm -hmm. Dewar. You remember that one? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, for me, I think my, one of my biggest takeaways was, when in that book, when he lays out, okay, here's a challenge ahead, here are the possible outcomes, here's how you get from a way to get from 59 gigatons per year of emissions down to zero. When you look at the buckets that he allocates, a big chunk of a lot of these buckets rely on innovations that are not yet commercialized. And so to me, it just reinforces it is an absolute must that we have to be bold and scale new clean tech solutions boldly and rapidly, because we already know that doing more of the same is not going to be enough to solve climate change. Yeah. Do you have a morning or evening routine or specific rituals that give you leverage in yeah. your day? Yeah. I recently got into this practice of um, kind of gratitude in the morning um, yeah. because, you know, it can be very stressful when you're trying to solve hard challenges. And so finding a way to start the day with positivity and it just gives you a different energy and, uh, you know, just, um, zest to start the day with. So that's, that's one. And then I'd also say one more book recommendation that I gift to people in the energy space is, um, the power of habit and, uh, yeah, Charles and, Big. Yes. And there's, there's something about that one that, um, 
I've actually used to form new habits, including running, for example, running outdoors, something that I never used to do. And now, now I'm a full addict. I'm going to note, and this is a really weird, random thing for mm-hmm. both of your examples are by authors whose last name ends in a double consonant. That is very random. How random is that? (laughs) Oh, man. Um, I, you know, what's funny is I've had uh, so many people recommend books over 650 episodes that um, I've, you know, I've heard a number who recommend uh, John Doerr and a a lot who um, have used the power of habit to to instill habits in their life. Sorry, I didn't give you anything new this time. No, uh, uh-uh. this reinforces it. Re- reinforces actually. So, um, I'm. I just think it's funny that I just noticed as I was writing them down that they both mm-hmm. are uh, d- d- double constant last uh, last letters, but they are seminal reading. If um, you know, in certainly in the top twenty books that have been recommended on the on the podcast or that I would recommend to others, um, uh, kind of alongside power of habit is. Uh, a slightly newer one, Atomic Habits, mm. and builds a lot. And he gives a lot of credit to to Charles Duhigg, uh, but he builds a lot on the the core information in the power of habit. And I think the trigger habit is one of the key things that Charles Duhigg introduced this con- this concept that yes. when I do this, then I then it triggers that. Yes, right. Like I when love I went. Yeah. Do you have a trigger to incite gratitude to get that practice going? You know, I think it's when I get into the car. Um, because, and so I, I, I guess I have to get one for days that I don't get into the car. But yeah, you know, when I'm on my when I'm on my commute, um, it's an easy way to you close the door and you kind of you know if you're on the same commute every day, you zone out anyway, mm-hmm. um, a little bit while you're driving. So just yeah. having having that kind of because I'm not one to sit in bed and and do that in the morning. So it's definitely a, I got to be on the move and kind of be thinking about yeah. it you know, on the way someplace. Yeah. Yep. And it is hard between the getting up and the getting children going and the getting to work to stop. Yes. And, to, and I think most people forget that gratitude isn't like, it's not like a five, 10, 30 minute meditation practice. It can simply be, it can be an instant instantaneous moment, just like prayer. I was raised a, a Southern Baptist. So prayer for mm. Southern Baptists is more like a half hour thing. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> And, and, but if, if you really read uh, scripture, um, it suggests that prayer is a continuous thing, just like gratitude can mm-hmm. be. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, where, if folks are so inclined, and I'm sure they will be, could they learn more about Heliogen and also connect with you? Oh, yeah. So they can go to our website, heliogen.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn and I, uh, I'm making it one of my new habits is to try to be more directly engaged and interactive there. So I try to get to things when I, when I'm able to, and, um, yeah, look forward to, um, you know, hearing from folks who are interested in our story and what we can help people do with decarbonization. Beautiful. Well, let's end today as we usually do with a bold prediction. Um, when we look out to the next 15 to 20 years, our goal by 2050 is a decarbonized grid, um, you know, it often helps to think about achieving those goals by standing at the finish line, looking backwards. If I'm standing with you, uh, shaking hands, cause we've accomplished it. It's 2050. We're mm-hmm. proud of the accomplishment that we've gotten to a net zero grid. What did we get right? Ooh, I, there's, there's so much you could say there. And I think a lot of, you know, I think we hear a lot about policy that's needed and investment that needed. And I'm going to go with actually education. We got the education right. Because I think it's um, it's so easy for decision makers and stakeholders to gravitate toward what they're familiar with, the thing that's least new. And we already know that relying solely on the things that are already deployed is not going to be enough to get us to net zero. And so really educating folks in a way that allows them to be aware of all of the tools in their toolbox and all the options in front of them and how to put things on an apples to apples comparison basis. Um, I think that's really something that will be helpful in accelerating our ability to deploy fast. Uh, and I think, you know, speed and scale is exactly the couple of words that I think we, we need there. Christy Obiaya is the chief executive officer of Heliogen, a next gen concentrating solar thermal 
power plant company tackling the energy transition and bringing compact power solutions to a neighborhood near you. Christy, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. And thank you to the ICR team for helping make it all possible as well. Nico, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. All right, Solar Warriors. Well, I'm glad that you have stuck around all the way to the end. I love hanging out with you end of episode listeners. Uh, I know maybe you're stuck on your treadmill or your bike or you're on a run and you just can't reach the next button. For whatever reason, you're still listening. I am grateful. I'd love to know, what did you learn? I sure learned a ton. I truly thought before this interview, I would have told you that concentrating solar thermal uh, was a technology that had, not, had, had lost the race, had lost the fight. And Christy has, I think, proven me wrong. And many of you, I would bet. And is challenging my thought process around what is the ideal product mix for this microgrid of the future. I'm a big fan concentrating solar. The only thing I don't like about concentrating solar, it seems that Heliogen has fixed, and that would be the absolute nano precision required. Uh, nanometer. What was it that she used? There was a term. Uh, and with AI and modern technology and processors, we're able to address that one, for me, critical failure. Uh, my hat's off to the Heliogen team. Um, I'm grateful to all of those who helped make this episode come together. And Christy, going the extra mile then, um, while traveling to jump back on to finalize their recording because we had some technical failures uh, early on. Thank you, everyone. If you're still listening because you are an infinite learner, well, then you, my fellow Philomath, can find all the resources used to dig deeper into the preparation for this episode, the books that Christy referenced, and more at mysuncast.com by clicking on the show notes page. We should have it linked right there in the description of your podcast. That page is where you'll find Christy's LinkedIn and the company website. All those goodies are waiting for you. Right there, we've done the work for you, both in this episode and all of the others. I've had, I've had that question asked very recently. How do I find their social media? Can you make it? Can you just put it in the description? Well, we have, and it's right there. I'd like to say thank you as well to our sponsors who help make this content free for you each and every week. If you'd like to learn more about them, you can at mysuncast.com forward slash sponsor. That's also where you could learn how you could partner with us to reach thousands of solar warriors and clean tech champions twice a week, just like they do. And of course, tune in every Thursday for these long and interesting deep dives with industry executives. We call them executive profiles or for shorter vignettes on Tuesdays. We call those tactical Tuesdays, deep dives with subject matter experts to help prepare and equip you for the energy transition for your career and business growth. Remember, you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solar Warrior. It's half the battle.